This is Nursing 622, Module 12. We're talking about the first half of the psychosocial disorders. Your learning objectives. Uh, we're going to talk more about the psychiatric disorders, distinguishing the timing of screening, communication, treatment, and prognosis, referrals out for the adult population. When you're looking at assessment of a patient psychosocially, you're looking at the autonomy and independence that they have already. Look at the dignity, the credibility, the respect, identity, individuality. Each patient is going to be different. The communication skills, their sense of belonging, and then touch. Some people need a significant amount of distance. Some people are right up next to you and don't really have that concern. When we talk about agitation, we talk about the signal symptom that it's a change in behavior. This is that sudden onset of restlessness, aggression, delusions, hallucinations. You know, this is from neurobiological changes in the brain that precipitate this lower threshold to overstimulation environmental triggers. Something is setting off the agitation, whether it's metabolic from a differential diagnosis or if it's something in the environment. The occurrence varies depending on the type of cognitive impairment that the patient is experiencing. We see this more in older adults. There's a higher incidence in females. Um, cog cognitive and sensory impairment can contribute to increased agitation, social isolation, bed rest, pain, hunger. Those different environmental triggers, hot, cold, a lot of people, close space, and then those psychosocial triggers as well. When we look at those signs and symptoms, the restlessness, the pacing, they don't necessarily come out and say, hey, I'm annoyed, I'm agitated. There can be yelling, hitting, spitting, verbal aggression, new delusions, hallucinations. They're just not acting like their normal self. Diagnostic tests, of course, we want to rule out those metabolic causes. An infection panel, make sure they don't have a urinary tract infection that's causing it. Make sure there isn't something else causing them pain and they can't verbalize it. They have pneumonia, so their chest hurts, they're coughing, they're agitated, their abdomen hurts, so they're restless, moving around. Looking at that complete metabolic panel, is there an electrolyte abnormality? Is there sodium low? We know that a low sodium decreases the threshold for seizures. Is their potassium elevated? Are they having cardiac arrhythmias? What's their B12 level? Are they anemic so they're not feeling so well? Looking at those thyroid studies, remember with the endocrine, you lose that ability to thermoregulate. Is that causing an issue? So if making sure there isn't a differential diagnosis is crucial here when you're dealing with psychosocial. We can treat with psychotropic meds, behavioral interventions, calming environment, decreasing the stimuli, lowering the lights, turning off the TV. And then we're going to monitor those lab reports, treat any infections, follow up, monitor, review all of their medications, make sure there isn't any drug to drug interactions. So in the sequela, we look at the injury to patients or caregivers, falls, specialized care, hospitalization. They might need some temporary placement. There might be some other things that need to be put in place. They might need to be isolated until they're not a danger to themselves or others. And we look at those risk factor reductions. If we know that Johnny gets upset at night, we're gonna to start to decrease that stimuli a little bit before it's time for bed. Decrease the lights, tell them to turn the TV off. We're gonna help them relax, warm tea, those different things to help reduce those risk factors. And then looking at a person-centered care model and long-term care and assisted living. If there's somebody they don't like, then why have them be their caregiver? If they respond differently to somebody else and they have more of that relationship, why not utilize that? And look at each individual separately instead of X, Y, and Z, this is a task that has to be done. Referrals to geriatric psychiatrists because they understand the cognitive function and impairment as well as the psychosocial. Neurological can help with pharmacological management. And then we educate. We educate those people at home as well as staff and facilities about safety and fall prevention, those triggers. How can we redirect? How can we decrease the stimuli? How can we bring it down a notch so that we've now decreased the tension and everybody starts to relax? Simplify activities. If they get frustrated with different things, make it a more simpler activity for them. Keep that routine. Just like with your kids, you have a routine, you have a structure. As we age and get older, and especially when dementia comes into play, 
having that routine and structure is very important. Promote rest, promote sleep. We know we get agitated when we haven't slept, when we're hungry, and having that consistency, like I said, with caregiver assignments. Another, another chronic psychosocial problem that we see is alcohol misuse. Um, oftentimes, this can be just from habit. It can be genetic. It can be from chronic alcoholism because that's what they've always done. Or it can also be a coping mechanism. Signal symptoms could be some transient confusion. They're not sleeping well. GI issues. You can smell the alcohol on their breast. They have tremors in the morning and you see them wanting to go drink alcohol. Their memory isn't how it used to be. Having some peripheral neuropathy a little bit in the fingers. This is a pathological pattern of alcohol use that encompasses social, occupational, functional impairment. It usually occurs for at least a month and can reoccur over quite a long period of time. So we look at the etiology. Is it biological, environmental, psychological, sociological? Is it because of the environment they're in? Is it their coping mechanism from a stressor? Is there a genetic predisposition to this? Approximately 16% of older adults are considered risky drinkers. When you look at the age, gender, the ethnicity, more middle-aged adults are at risk for alcohol-related problems, including, including DWI, medical issues. It is more common in men. Major lifestyle changes can contribute to this midlife crisis. Remember, we know this from that starting at the age of 35. There could be a loss, and this is their coping mechanism. Age-related changes, they don't know how to deal with things. Signs and symptoms of alcohol misuse are the actual abuse event. You see it. They get tachycardic. They have that peripheral neuropathy in their fingers, in their toes. There has been physical trauma, maybe secondary to falls, maybe a motor vehicle accident. Their liver starts to enlarge as well as their spleen, secondary to this chronic alcohol use. They can have some mild hypertension. Why? Because as you're drinking this alcohol, as your liver is trying to process everything, you are then increasing that peripheral resistance and the vascularity, and therefore you can have some vasoconstriction that can lead to some elevation of blood pressure. We look at diagnostic tests. Again, your history, I've said it many times, is so important. Those screening tools that we talk about. And remember, when you ask them how many drinks you drink a week, the rule of thumb, which I have no data technically to back it up is, for guys, you add a six pack and a half or so to what they tell you. In women, it's about a six pack because we don't want to admit it, right? Look at those lab studies. Look at those electrolytes. We know if they're drinking alcohol, they're likely not eating as well. So their albumin is decreased. Their sodium is decreased. When we see it with their albumin decrease because they're not getting that nutrition, and as their sodium is decreasing, we know they're at risk for seizures. Their sodium's decreasing, their potassium's elevating, increased risk for cardiac arrhythmias. And then physical examination. Sometimes you can just tell they're not eating, they're only drinking, and you can tell when they come in for your visit. Ruling out a differential diagnosis, of course. We wanna make sure that there is nothing medically going on that we're linking to possible alcohol misuse. Treatment of uh, alcohol misuse is based on the level and severity. Again, education, motivational, that cognitive behavioral therapy. Coming full circle and having the whole family involved. If the kids are present or if the parents, if it's a teenager, young adult, having it come full circle so they know they have that support system. Follow up initially weekly. Monitor. How are you doing? Are you managing? What do I need to do to help you still continue on the path? for improvement. And then once they're participating in that treatment protocol, going to outpatient therapy, having an improvement, then you can decrease it to monthly. Unfortunately, some of the side effects we can see sequela is the GI bleeding, the gastritis, the peripheral neuropathy, decreased functional ability. They can have a cognitive decline. And again, you can start to develop some hepatic encephalopathy secondary to liver disease and cirrhosis where they'll have those altered mental, but it's because they've had that cognitive decline from the encephalopathy. 
So then we know when we're looking at treatment plans that we have to then adjust based on that cognitive decline and what's been going on. And also knowing about polypharmacy with these liver disease. A lot of these medications like Tylenol, we worry about the liver. So we need to make sure that we're coming full circle and looking at everything, including the meds there on as needed. Prevention and prophylaxis is a brief drink, drinking history with their annual wellness visit. You get asked at your primary care, doing the screening tools. Again, referral to inpatient detox if necessary, mental health professional, community-based program. Remember, if they are a heavy drinker, they might need to go inpatient to the hospital. They can have delirium tremors and seizures withdrawing from the alcohol. They can have electrolyte abnormalities that are so significant that need cardiac monitoring in the hospital. Everybody is different. Inpatient may be needed for some, outpatient may, may be okay for others. When you look at education, we talk about it. We talk about the treat, treatment program, like I said, the support groups, the consequences of continued use, especially when you're looking at DWIs and, hey, you might be facing jail time if you have it again. What do you actually consider a drink measurement? Clarification of risks and benefits of moderate drinking and what it can lead to. And then those resources in the community. You don't have to know everything, but you need to know where to find it. Anxiety. Anxiety is very common, especially with COVID. Um, this is the excessive worrying that is difficult, difficult to control and interfere with daily life, right? We want to be able to control ourselves. We need some element of control. And when that gets taken from us, we can get anxious. Some people have coping mechanisms to manage that and some do not. You can have somatic symptoms, headaches, back pain, abdominal pain, and this could be all anxiety related. It's common in older adults, but it's not a normal aging process. It often goes hand in hand with depression. Largely, it's unknown. The etiology, risk factors, female, anxious personality, stressors or traumas early in life, and any disabilities. It's more prevalent in Caucasians and African Americans, more prevalent in females. I like to think that's secondary to our hormones, but hey. Signs and symptoms are just their physical complaints. You could have them coming in chronically, abdominal pain, abdominal pain, abdominal pain, headache, headache, headache. What is going on? My workup's been negative. What is going on? Look at the psychosocial. Are they anxious? Is there stressors in life? Are they having a difficult time? Worried about health, worried about disability, worried about finances and other things. The COVID pandemic. Diagnostic tests, of course, we want that complete uh, health history with physical examination and again, Laboratory studies, rule out any chronic conditions that could be causing it. Is their thyroid off? Are their electrolytes off? Are they battling an infection? They're just not feeling well. Looking at treatment is focused on reducing the symptoms, improve functioning, right? We want to get their quality of life as optimized as possible. So this is gonna differ. It's based on the severity of symptoms, how much it impairs their functioning, their activities of daily living, their quality of life, their family, their work, all of those things. And sequela, there's a higher morbidity, mortality rate um, with anxiety as well as uh, disability. Prevention, prophylaxis, stress management, social support, daily routines. If they know they're gonna be in a stressful environment, okay, what helps you? What do you do to cope? What do you do for things? Having a referral to a mental health professional, appropriate medical specialist, recognizing and managing these anxiety disorders. So then bipolar disorders, variable presentation, they can be depressed, mania, hypomania, they could be a different person when they come see you in the office. Feelings of grandiosity, rapid speech, spending a lot. These are what you see with bipolar disorders. Approximately 25% in older adults, genetic predisposition is very common. Again, taking a good family health history is important. Recurrent mood disorder with broad spectrum is usually the description. They can come in for mania the first time and then be hypomanic or depressed the next time. You have that bipolar one disorder where it's at least one episode of mania and then bipolar two is at least one hypomanic and one major depressive or disorder. Peak of onset is usually 15 to 30. Um, genetic vulnerability, again, a family history of it, life stressors, medical illnesses, these all play a role in bipolar disorders and every psychosocial. 
We then look at these other medical illnesses that could be contributing to this as well. Signs and symptoms, elevated mood, then they're irritable, then they can be depressed, they can have some cognitive impairment. So we do these screening tools and try to look at some of the somatic symptoms as well as how their behaviors has been, look at lab studies, how is their thyroid, how is their electrolytes, is there any imaging that needs to be performed. Look at other differential diagnosis. And then sometimes inpatient treatment may need to happen. If they go into a psychosis and cannot manage themselves, they might need inpatient. We look at the collaborative care model in the inpatient setting where we have that holistic approach using psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, counseling. Follow-up needs to be regular. We need to monitor those periods of mania depression. They need to know that if they start to see themselves getting into a manic episode, or a depressive episode that they can come in and be seen or talk to somebody. Prevention and prophylaxis is again to decrease stress, educate them about the disorder, referral to psychiatry, reinforce and re-educate patients, especially if there's a known family history. Talk to caregivers, look at lifestyle changes, look at resources available. Depression is very common. Um, Oftentimes people don't want to admit it. There's a lot of psychological influences, psychosocial, cognitive dysfunction. They are withdrawn. Aging adults are at increased risk. It is more common in women age 65 years or older. However, when it comes to suicide risk, men are more apt at the age of 65 or older to go through with suicide and use it with like gunshot wounds and those types of suicide attempts. Minority cultures living amongst the dominant majority culture are of course at a higher risk. We look at the contributing factors of genetics, psychosocial, physical illnesses, any other psych illnesses, any medications. Are they just not feeling well with it? The beta blockers, my libido's decreased, I feel like crap because my heart rate's down and I can't manage and I'm done. I don't want to deal with it. These are things that all come into play. We look at the signs and symptoms with their affect, their mood, their cognition, how they behave when we interact with them. Looking at lab studies, following their normal routine, electrolyte panels, their blood counts, clinical evaluations, the scales, different questions. Monitor how they interact with other people. Making sure there's no other differential diagnosis, checking their thyroid function, making sure that is not decreased or increased looking at their electrolytes, looking at their liver functions, checking to make sure that we don't have a metabolic cause that could be contributing to this depression. Treatment is focused on full remission and recovery. However, we get them to optimize their quality of life as best possible. This is the inclusion of pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, these complementary alternative therapies, yoga, music, whatever works for them and in integrating that into their health program. Educate them about the disease process with depression. What are the causative factors? Heritability, if you notice this in your children or others, make sure you talk to them, say, hey, you're not alone. I'm dealing with this too. And the risk for relapse and reoccurrence with suicide is so high, especially with the COVID pandemic and monitoring when they reach out for help, pay attention. You might be the last person they actually reach out to. Looking at treatment strategies, psychotropic meds may ultimately be indicated. Assessing for suicidal ideations, having them know that there's somebody out there, there's that phone number that they can call if they're feeling depressed and they wanna kill themselves. And remember, in the sequela, this is impaired interpersonal relationships. There's a lot of strain with families, pet friends, peers, interpersonal problems, battling with themselves. And this then increases their medical comorbidities, their chronic medical conditions, their risk factors go up, and then their cognitive impairment further progresses. We look at prevention and prophylaxis to minimize those risk factors, look at lifestyle modifications, decrease, decrease the complications of late life depression, referring out to psychiatry, psychologists, counselors, whomever they wanna to talk to, 
to be able to help decrease that stress that they feel from the depression, improve their quality of life, and they might not want to talk to you about it, but could talk to a third party who doesn't know anything about them. Prescription drug misuse, we look at signal symptoms with, that are variable, um, the pinpoint pupils, the constipation, confusion, memory loss, depression, behavioral symptoms. This is the willful use of prescribed drugs for non-medical purposes. Accidental can be due to inaccurate dosing, sharing with another person, and then accepting drugs prescribed for another person at someone's own will. There is a genetic predisposition for this. You can have coexisting mental health problems and they just want a quick fix to try to feel better. Oftentimes it's associated with a substance abuse problem, including recreational drugs, alcohol, Age, gender, and ethnicity show that there's a higher rate in 50 to 64 year olds and it's more common in men, but it's not treated as much in women. Why? Because of that stigma that goes along with it. I am the woman. I'm supposed to manage everything and be able to do everything and we don't want to admit it as much. Signs and symptoms can vary depending on the drug class. Drug seeking behavior may be the initial sign. They may have chronic pain that they constantly want medication for. They may say, oh, I lost my medicine, or, oh, I'm always anxious, or I need this. Paying attention to those may clue you in that there is an issue with drug misuse. They could be confused, disoriented, slurred speech when you're talking to them, and they might say, oh, I'm just tired today. That's my problem. Lack of perception that prescribing drug abuse is problematic is a contributing factor. So as a prescriber, paying attention to what medications they're on and how often you're giving it to them, their support system and their medical history is your responsibility. You'll notice they have that unmet need for chronic pain relief, other mental health problems, substance abuse, a genetic predisposition, and just that general availability of the medication. Random urine drug screens a lot of times are required by primary care physicians to make sure that they're actually number one, taking their medication, and number two, that they're not taking any other medications you are not prescribing. Use those screening tools, use the screening, the brief intervention, and then refer out to treatment. Utilize those resources that are in place. And then making sure there's no differential diagnosis. Are they having significant pain because they have a chronic abdominal pain that they're not getting worked up. And yeah, you might think they're seeking drugs, but it's because they haven't worked up this GI issue because they have too many things at home and they don't want to know if there's a problem GI wise. Treatment depends on the extent of the abuse, the particular class of drugs. It could require an acute care setting, outpatient, but again, supportive care, close monitoring, looking at the support system and community resources is key. Follow-up will be individualized with these patients and then sequela unfortunately can lead to death with overdose and alcohol and drug interactions. So we look at educating the patient, assessing the pain, assessing the abuse potential, telling them, I'm prescribing you this in the short term. And after that, we're gonna look and see what other avenues we can go to because of the abuse potential. We're gonna do the randomized drug testing. We're gonna do the prescription drug monitoring programs that they have through New York State. We're gonna look and try to help you not abuse these medications. Referral to the addiction specialists, treatment programs, community-based supports, education about the danger of sharing drugs, use and misuse of prescription drugs. And then you have your textbooks, readings, and additional resources.